Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Wallace Collection online. Um, I make it 5.59, so I'm going to wait just a minute or so more to let, to let people come in, and then we'll get started. So I make it six o'clock by my, by my clock. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Wallace Collection Online. Thank you for joining us for this talk on Turner and Colour in connection with the Arts History Festival 2023. I'm sure you are looking forward to this as much as I am tucked inside on this rainy day. My name is Lucy, and I will be shortly handing over to our speaker, Dr. Matthew Morgan, in just a few moments time. I'm also delighted to introduce to you Dr. Christina Bradstreet, who is the Head of Programmes at the Association for Art History, who I will now hand over to say a few words. Oh, well, good evening um, and um, welcome. Um, welcome to the Art History Festival 2023, um, which we're delighted to say the Wallace Collection are taking part in. Um, my name's Christina Bradstreet. I'm the Head of Programmes at the Association for Art History. And I'm just delighted to welcome you to this talk. We're at day two now of our UK-wide Art History Festival, which runs from today, um, from yesterday, in fact, right through to this Sunday. Um, and the Art History Festival is all about celebrating and exploring art history. So the study of art from the ancient world to the present day across the globe. And it's for everyone who enjoys art, architecture and design and wants to deepen those interests. So this is our third edition of the festival, um, and this year we've joined up with 52 partner organisations, including museums and galleries and other arts organisations across the UK, from Orkney to Penzance, who are holding a wealth of talks, tours in conversations, workshops and family events in person or online. And in terms of online events, if that's your thing, highlights um, tomorrow include a talk with Autograph ABP about um, black women's photography, as well as a talk on Trinidadian textile designer Althea McNish, amongst a wealth of other events. Um, if you're working but can get out on Friday nights, um, you might want to look at the National Gallery late, um, the National Portrait Gallery late, and also the Courtauld Institute, um, which has a launch of their spaces in Vernon Square. So yes, lots more events still to take place um, all across the country this week, online or at an art gallery near you. So do take a look at our festival programme on our website, um, forarthistory.uk sorry, forarthistory.org.uk um, and on social media for Art History. I'll, I'll pop that in the chat for you as well. That's it. That's all from me. Um, enjoy the talk and I'll hand back to Lucy. Thank you, Christina. Um, just before I hand over to Matthew, um, just some brief housekeeping notices. Um, firstly, if you have any difficulties with Zoom, uh, please do drop me a message using the Zoom Q&A function, or you can email at learning at wallacecollection.org. That's learning at wallacecollection.org, and I'll do my best to help as quickly as possible. Secondly, if you have any questions regarding Matthew's talk, please make use of the Q&A to send them through at any point, and I'll pass them on to him at the end. And finally, if you miss anything, don't worry, the whole talk is being recorded and a link to this recording will be emailed out in the 24 hours after the event. And this will be available for two weeks following the recording being released. So by way of introduction, um, Dr. Matthew Morgan is Museum Director of Turner's House in Twickenham and an Associate Lecturer at Birkbeck, University of London. He has worked in the heritage sector for 10 years, including at the Royal Collection and the National Gallery. Prior to that, he was director at Christie's. 
He's taught diverse audiences across the UK, as well as making a series of short films which can be seen on YouTube. So without further ado, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you very much, Christina. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you, wherever you may be. Um, this, of course, is one of the strangenesses of uh, talks on Zoom, is that uh, uh, who knows where everybody is. Um, hopefully you can all see me and hear me. Um, if not, do let me know. Um, otherwise, uh, it, you won't be getting the uh, a full uh, a, a, a talk that you might be getting. So I think it's fair to say, um, and I, I'm not really being very controversial here, that Turner was um, one of the greatest and undoubtedly one of the most innovative uh, colorists, not really just of his age, but I think of any age. Um, and although some of his early works can be quite dark, um, and I would even describe some of them as somber, his later works are positively bursting with color. We can see these brilliant yellows, uh, the reds, the purples, uh, crimsons, blues. Some of you may be familiar with this painting. This is the Fighting Temeraire. And uh, the sky, which we have here, has been long praised for uh, the vibrancy of its colour. And um, really, one can sort of trace um, the earliest elements of some of his uh, fascination with colour all the way back to um, 1819, when he made his first uh, trip to Italy. And what happened then was that he did two things, really. He observed, so he looked, um, and he experimented. He um, tried different methods in his painting. And this experimentation was uh, recognized um, at the time. Uh, in 1823, um, an encyclopedia uh, claimed that Turner's work seems to, quote, tremble on the verge of some new discovery of color. I love that, isn't it? But I think importantly, he was thinking about how colors work and how we, we the viewers, perceive them. And that really is the core of the science of color. Turner relied on uh, new uh, new colors, uh, new synthetic colors, new chromes, uh, cobalts, uh, greens. Um, and he was a very enthusiastic adopter of these new synthetic colors. Particularly, he turned to people such as the color manufacturer, George Field, for advice about uh, new pigments. And his later works, I believe, seem to almost completely dispense with design or form. Uh, in the Renaissance, that would have been called disegno. And he is replacing this focus with a new focus, focus on color, um, colore, as they would say in the Renaissance. And his contemporaries recognize this too. Uh, William Hazlitt famously described Turner's works or his later works as pictures of nothing and very like. So in this lecture, we're going to look at Turner's relationship with colour, both in terms of the practical use that he made of colour and in terms of colour theory, uh, particularly colour theories which were developing at the time. Um, Britain is often thought, uh, particularly on a day like today, uh, as being wet and dark. And um, I think that's especially true if we compare uh, the weather in this country to, uh, say, the weather in the Mediterranean, or even somewhere like India. And London in particular um, had, in turn this time, a reputation for being smoky and grey, um, and it was uh, becoming increasingly polluted. Um, but it was also a time in which uh, people were coming to Britain, returning in some cases to Britain, uh, and particularly coming to London, which was a if not the major international port at the time. And they were bringing with them their memories, their memories of places that were full of color. And people wanted to recreate this, these memories, um, these colorful experiences. And um, it's possible to see that in um, architecture, interior design. So people who could afford it were decorating their homes uh, with much more brilliant colors. I suppose in effect, trying to bring home something of the color that they'd see in other countries. We're looking here at uh, Sir John Soames Museum, and we're looking particularly at the 
I think absolutely wonderful, uh, yellow living room. It's almost a sort of an Indian yellow, really, isn't it? And Sonia and Turner were uh, fantastic friends, great friends, and both were fascinated by the effects of colour. Particularly, both men were fascinated by the colour yellow. So advances in technology were bringing new colours onto the market to meet this increased demand, this increased demand for um, the brightness in people's houses. I mean, look at the depth of this yellow on the walls. Isn't it just fabulous? So at a time when there's more demand for colours, the range of colours for an artist also became uh, much greater, much more varied. And the colours themselves uh, started to become much more intense, much brighter. And Turner was uh, a, a, what we might now call a, an early adopter. He was extremely enthusiastic about these colours. Let's look for a moment at this, I, I mean, I think absolutely remarkable work from um, 1838. Um, but while we're doing that, I'm just going to take us back a little bit to um, 1828, when the American landscape artist Thomas Cole, uh, himself incredibly, hugely influenced by Turner, was able to say uh, that he was struck by the, quote, splendid combinations of colour when it is considered separately from the subject. So Cole here is saying that Turner's use of colour can be considered separately from his approach to form or composition. And he goes on to say, Cole goes on to say that every object appears transparent or soft. And in some ways, I think we can see that here. So um, anonymous critic uh, remarked that the uh, Turner's painting Sun Rising Through Vapours, um, a painting produced in 1807, but you can now see it in the National Gallery. And this title, Sun Rising, Rising Through Vapours, um, could almost be a generic title for almost all of his paintings. And I think there's something in that. We see uh, a sun rising through vapours here. But the yellow is just remarkably, incredibly intense. It's undoubtedly, I think, the dominant colour here. The sun rising through the vapours, it's bathing the scene in the brightest of yellow lights. And it's bursting with this colour. The people, the buildings, the ships, are they really just a pretext for this exploration of what the yellow colour can do? Here we have uh, Turner's depiction of uh, the Lake of Petworth. Um, you can see it at Petworth House in the dining room. And um, when you finish looking at this painting, if you just turn around, uh, you can actually see the landscape that Turner's depicting uh, in front of you. And um, if you haven't been there, do go there. But um, having been there, I can um, completely confirm that uh, there's not that much yellow in the landscape, unfortunately. Um, but many of Turner's paintings are created uh, using this yellow, using uh, the, the, the yellow pigment, particularly a pigment called Indian yellow. So the sunsets, sunrises, the hazy days that we see are frequently created using uh, Indian yellow. And it was a clear, luminous, vivid orange yellow pigment, um, supposedly thought to be from India, hence, hence the name. And at the time, it was described as fluorescent, as bright, as bold, and artists used it in both oil and watercolour paintings. And it was said at the time, um, and has subsequently been, been uh, repeated, that um, Lord Agramont, who was the man who owned Petworth and uh, uh, commissioned uh, the view that we've just seen, um, particularly liked yellow, and it was really Turner's response to Egremont's needs, demands, uh, wishes, that provoked him into using it, prompted him into using it. I'm not really so sure that that's true, um, or certainly that uh, Turner started using yellow only because Egremont wanted it. So we're looking here at uh, a much earlier work, a work of 1809, um, and although it's much more muted than the two works we've just seen, um, I think you can see, I hope you can see, that the sky, the castle, the beach are all produced using yellow pigments. And I think wonderfully they combine to give this effect of a luscious, slightly lazy summer's day. We can almost feel the heat. It's remarkable. Indian yellow was sold as a large, solid uh, mustard coloured ball, or mustard coloured balls, um, which had a bright mango coloured centre. Um, and when Turner painted, he would have uh, ground the colour ball down and um, added um, acacia gum as a binding uh, mechanism, binding element. And the...
theory. Um, Sir so Joseph Hooker, uh, a Victorian uh, explorer, botanist, uh, set out to try and find the origins of this pigment people didn't know. Um, in the course of his research, Hooker uh, was contacted by a civil servant in India, a man called T. N. Mukherjee, um, and he um, wrote offering uh, an explanation of where the pigment had come from. According to uh, Mukherjee, uh, it was only produced in the Mizapur uh, district of India, and it was made uh, by cows who were fed exclusively on a diet of mango leaves and water. The cows allegedly produced three quarters of uh, luminous yellow urine per day. Uh, it was collected in small earthen pots and boiled each night. And the contents from these pots were then strained for the sediments, which were then rolled into a ball by hand. And the balls were then toasted over a fire and dried in the sun. <laughs> this sounds like an ugly repulsive job, if you ask me. Um, Unfortunately, uh, although this is an absolutely fantastic story, and I love it, like uh, many great stories, uh, it may very well not be true. Or at least uh, there were other sources of, uh, or plant-based sources, perhaps I should say, uh, of yellow pigments that were coming into um, England at the time, into Britain at the time. Amazingly, um, I think amazingly, we don't still really know where Indian yellow was made or how it was made. Uh, equally fascinating uh, in many ways, uh, by the middle of the 19th century, it had been almost completely replaced by uh, synthetic colours. Um, so we really don't have uh, access to this colour, uh, quite exactly this colour today. But I love that this, it, that this, this pigment um, here, we're looking at it being used to you know, paint a scene in Yorkshire, but it's got global connections. It's something that uh, has come from overseas, but here we are looking at it being used to depict an everyday scene of uh, children playing on a beach in England. And I think there's something romantic, something that actually you know, Turner's contemporaries also recognised about this, the mystery around this pigment. Where does it come from? Um, how is it produced? We still, I'm afraid, can't say. Um, in 1829, uh, the year after uh, Thomas Cole left Britain, uh, but the year before um, Turner finished the scene that we saw at Petworth, uh, he showed this painting uh, at the Royal Academy, Ulysses deriding Polyphemus. His use of colour, his uh, expressive experimental approach was um, at the time remarked on by uh, numerous critics. Um, and I've spoken about this painting in front of this painting uh, many times, and I can absolutely guarantee that the colour is still something that people remark on. It still jumps out at us. So in its review, the Morning Herald uh, wrote, this is a picture in which nature, truth and feeling are sacrificed to a melodramatic effect. In fact, it may be taken as a specimen, a specimen of, of colouring run mad, positive vermilion, positive indigo, and all the most glaring tints of green, yellow, and purple contained for mastery. So I think we can say not necessarily a very positive review. But the sheer exoticness of Turner's colours, um, frequently pointed out um, by uh, contemporaries. So a French critic uh, wrote that um, the painting was done by a Rembrandt born in India. So another reference to the maybe fundamentally un-English use of uh, colour, particularly Indian yellow. So Turner's use of colour didn't only have aesthetic implications. Uh, it set Turner apart from uh, his contemporaries, from other artists, and it challenged his viewers to appreciate colour as something apart from form or design, and to think about how colour is really not only an emotive force, but something that might be uh, perhaps universal. The paintings that we've been looking at were really only possible uh, because of the availability of new pigments, uh, uh, not just Indian yellow. And his primary source of these colours was the leading English colour maker of the 19th century, George Field. Um, Field and Turner first got to know each other uh, in the early part of the century. We're not quite sure when they first met. But without Field's contribution, Turner would undoubtedly be, not have been able to produce the dramatic effects that we've just been seeing. Um, just as an aside, um, uh, irony of ironies, perhaps, uh, that the um, only um, image of George Field appears to be this black and white mezzotint. Uh, nothing appears to have uh, survived in colour. Field uh, developed a, a press 
for extracting madder dyes, um, which he used to produce colors such as uh, berets of browns, uh, bright pinks, purples, reds, um, and of course, yellows. But just let's not get too carried away about uh, Turner and Field. Um, many other artists, uh, such as Constable, uh, not known for his colouring, Lawrence also perhaps not known for his colouring, went to field for their colours. So it wasn't just that Turner had access to these new colours, it's how he used them that sets him apart from his uh, fellow painters, from his contemporaries. And Field's theories about the use of colour also, um, I think, uh, contradicted Turner's and perhaps was sort of more in line with Constable's. Um, Field published uh, a very influential book, um, uh, Chromatics, uh, All the Analogy, Harmony and Philosophy of Colour, in 1835. And in the second edition, Field directly criticises Turner for, to quote, the beautiful error of applying the prism to his eye while painting, instead of representing objects as they naturally appear through the diffused solar spectrum of broad light and shade, by which error he converts the scene into a fool's paradise, seen through artifice, but not to the natural eye. Apparently, Turner responded to this by saying, you have not told us too much. That's just a beautiful put down. I think sort of Turner would have done well on Twitter. So Field here is criticising Turner for departing from painting what we could see and instead painting what Turner thinks we should see. That is not being true to nature and instead asking us, us the viewers, uh, to enter into perhaps a different visual world or a different engagement with the painting that we're looking at. And it's this disagreement between an artist and a scientist about the nature of colour and how pr really profoundly uh, uh, this changes the way the paintings are considered that exemplifies the differences between theory and practice in 18th century art. So now we're going to get into the science bit. So let's think a bit about colors. Um, primary colors, that's uh, these here, are, are those that can be combined to make other colors, but cannot uh, themselves be made by combining um, other colors. And these are usually considered to be red, yellow, and blue. Uh, the complements or the complementaries of each of the primary colors are uh, roughly made by mixing the two together. So we have red and blue making purple, blue and yellow making green, and yellow and red making orange. But when these complementary colors are combined, they tend to cancel each other out and they produce the gray color, which is what we see in the center here. But when these colors are placed next to each other, they create the strongest contrasts between these colors. So two colours applied in small daubs, for instance, side by side, um, and viewed at sufficient distance, can produce a different colour, a brilliant colour effect. And these small daubs, um, the way this works, they reflect rays of the respective hues, which mix on our retina in our eyes uh, to produce what's called um, an optical mixture. And traditional understandings of colour were based uh, entirely, really, on the experiences of colour pigments. That is, they're based on the experience of uh, using colours, uh, usually by artists. But the results of scientific research on coloured light um, didn't support the practical discoveries of artists. So in effect, science and experience were not aligned at this point. So here we have Sir Isaac Newton. Um, he published uh, his book Optics in 1784. And... Um, what really makes his books I mean, so groundbreaking is that before his work on light and colour, um, it was just widely assumed that colour was an attribute of an object. That is, the colour it was thought to be somehow transmitted from the object itself directly into our eyes. And Newton's work was enormously influential, um, led to a new awareness of the um, of colour in nature. And in effect, he really set the standard for scientific experiments in colour and its properties. And Newton proposed that there were seven primary colours uh, that constituted the spectrum colours of the rainbow, that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, he constructed his wheel of seven colours. We can see, uh, funny enough, uh, not coloured, but written in on the right-hand side. 
Um, and he seems to have done this uh, really b because he associated light with colour together. There's actually uh, no reason for colours to be depicted in a circle. They they actually appear in a linear progression uh, in the spectrum rather than any, any kind of sort of circular progression. But there's two elements of light that Newton really doesn't grasp in his book. Uh, and these would really be the central elements in the reason for development of color theory in the subsequent centuries. So firstly, um, Newton really didn't understand, he didn't grasp that uh, the, the colors that he was studying were produced um, not through the prism that he was uh, looking at, but were actually components of ordinary daylight. Actually, this is the, the, sort of the nature of light. But more importantly, he um, didn't really kind of uh, understand that the physical qualities of light that he was observing that were producing these pigments were different from the properties of pigments. So he was uh, observing and experimenting on the properties of light, but not on the properties of, prig of, of pigments. And that's not what he was experimenting on. And so although he was uh, wrong in assuming the qualities of light were the same as those of pigments, Actually, uh, the importance of his work was it implies the, 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 the possibility of applying these, uh, these theories, optical theory, to painting. So throughout the 18th century into the 19th century, uh, and, and as we, actually into the 20th century, a number of different theories of scientific uh, and theoretical approaches to color emerge. And one of the really very influential uh, approaches was by this guy that we see here, Moses Harris. Um, Harris uh, published his book, The Natural System of Colours, in 1776. And in this book, Harris uh, discusses uh, the multitude of colours that can be created using the three grand or principal, as he called them, colours, red, yellow and blue, primary colours. Um, and he was a naturalist and an engraver. And so he uh, naturally really sort of focused on the relationships between colours and how they're coded and created. And in his book, he explains how three colors, the, the, the three primary colors, can be intermixed, tinted, shaded, to create 660 colors, uh, materially or by the painter's art, he says. And he calls these compound colors. And importantly, I think, in his book, he produces two color wheels, which is what we're looking at here. The first on the left, the prismatic colors, primary colors, but the second, uh, the one that we're looking on the right, the compound hues, and these are the ones he claims are found in nature. So in this way, Harris is really sort of sidestepping the uh, problems, the issues between the effects of color and light um, and the effects of color and pigments by offering basically two separate systems. And we can see, I think here, that the prismatic colors are brighter, more colorful than the compound colors or the pigment-based colors. Um, and Harris's book uh, really, obviously, I think, intended to be a practical guide for artists. It's dedicated to Sir Joshua Reynolds. Reynolds, uh, in a way, a mentor in some ways to Turner. So it's um, very likely that Turner would have known about the book, even if he didn't read it. And we can see here that Turner's interest in optics in relation to paintings uh, is, is, is revealed by these diagrams. Um, and these diagrams come from his notes for lectures that he prepared and then delivered at the Royal Academy as part of a series of lectures that he gave um, as Professor of Perspective. And these diagrams were produced to support his lectures. So they were shown uh, much as we're seeing the slides now. The diagram on the left, number one, has a watermark, can, can be dated from 1822, while number two has a watermark from 1824, which Fascinatingly, then, means that we know that from at least 1822, Turner was thinking about color theory. And almost certainly, um, from at least 1822, he's engaging with it, uh, I, I would say, really, in many ways, throughout the rest of his life. And we can see here that he is uh, emphasizing and thinking about the importance of the primary colors, uh, red, yellow, and blue. Um, when we compare Harris here on the left and Turner's diagrams on the right, I, I hope you can see, I, I think it's, it's reasonably clear that uh, Turner's engaging in, you know, in, in, in color theories, as we're swimming in the same pool as Harris, uh, again, leading me to, to, to believe that, that he's aware of Harris's work. 
And from the manuscript notes that Turner uh, made for his lecture, uh, we can see he's selecting six major hues, exactly the ones found in Harris's wheel, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. And in Turner's diagram, uh, we, we can see that he is showing how colors change according to the times of day, uh, light at the top, uh, dark at the bottom, um, as it changes throughout the day. And in Turner's, I'm frankly terrible and difficult to understand English, uh, he writes, as primaries, the colors are able to show light and darkness by themselves. In compounds, the combinations of grays, brown, and neutrals is infinite in the progression towards black. Again, I think kind of revealing uh, that he is engaging with Harris. But in his lectures, Turner observes that white light, um, the, the, the red, yellow, and blues, when mixed together, produce white in, 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 in light, but that the mixture of the same three colors in pigments um, results in the destruction of colors and produces what he calls monotony, discord, and mud. So he's differentiating here between the theories of colors, between Newton's experimentation with light and the realities of being an artist, that is, working with pigments. And he's very aware that while primary colors don't mix easily, when placed side by side, they have dramatic effects. So in the early 1820s, Turner's painting becomes brighter, uh, more colorful. And he's starting to experiment in both watercolors and oils in capturing different effects of light, a uh, uh, forceful, bright light. And this is, as I mentioned earlier on, stimulated at least by his trip to Italy in 1819. And he sees this bright Mediterranean light for the first time. Also, um, he gets to engage with the works of his uh, artistic hero, Claude Lorraine. When he returns, he starts to use uh, all sorts of different techniques, including lighter grounds to try and capture this light. Um, and as we could just seen, um, he's becoming increasingly interested at the same time in the theory of color and light. And we can see that the first examples of experiments uh, in this regard are uh, watercolors. And he uh, produces a series of watercolors in the 1820s that are intended to be engraved for two series, uh, river scenery and ports of England. And in many of these watercolors, we can see that his coloring is so intricate, so consistent with the theories that we've just been exploring. I just don't think it's possible that they that this is just chance. Um, and I should point out that his diagrams of color, um, as we have also just seen, uh, were produced at around exactly the same time as these uh, watercolors. So it's almost uh, happening at the same time. We're looking here at uh, his um, a, a picture of Norham Castle. And this is a subject he returned to often. He first painted it in 1797. Um, and the initial picture was, uh, he felt one that made his name. Um, and it's it's really uh, a scene that he returns to uh, frequently. Here we see the castle is drenched in a purple blue shadow. The sun is rising behind it, casting uh, a long shadow here over the River Tweed. Um, how? we might ask, as Turner achieved this, this wonderful effect of light. It's not so easy to see in this slide. Um, and um, if you ever get a chance to see it, it's uh, at Tate currently not on view, sadly. Um, do go and have a look at the original work. It, it, it's absolutely remarkable. It's just, just, just sort of you know, mind blowing, if I can use that phrase. And when you see it, you can see that particularly in the reflection of the castle here, um, the fine broken strokes of color uh, blue strokes intermingling with green. We can maybe just to make them out on this slide. Uh, oops. Um, um, just also, if we get a chance to sort of look look more carefully, just um, in the reflection, we can see Turner's included sort of slender curving bands, but also dots of vermilion, and these are interspersed with pale spots of green, uh, also yellow, um, and little lines of blue. And the effect that it has here on us, on our eyes, oops, is to um, allow us to see it as a wonderful deep purple. introduced together are producing a color that is much richer and deeper than if he had mixed them and much richer and deeper than anything that he could possibly have produced as a single pigment. 
And if we look a little bit more closely at the um, purple of the castle itself, um, hopefully you can see, if you can't look a bit, to lean into your uh, screen perhaps, uh, um, perhaps you, yeah, it'd be easier to see that way, but hopefully you'll be able to see these tiny stippled strokes of blue um, and over those, the, the twisting threads of vermilion that Turner has introduced. And if we look a little bit lower on the rocks, um, just to the right of the castle, he's introducing little red dots over the blue and the threads and the dots are fusing optically uh, to create this vivid purple color. And it's such a rich purple, such deep purple. Um, I, I'm not really sure that he would have been able to achieve this color just by a color mixing. And these color combinations, the, the, the separation of the colors, the use of the colors, the individual strokes that he is using, and really also the shapes that he's uh, 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 using for the colors all suggest to me that Turner is very aware of these principles of uh, optical mixing. Uh, maybe not in a scientific way, but he is aware that, uh, as lots of the color theorists were at the time, what the effects of uh, putting these colors together would be, and he's using it to the most remarkable effect. Um, we're looking here at one of my favorite turners, actually, uh, Shields uh, on the River Tyne. Um, and just as an aside, it, 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 one of the things I love about it is it's at once a painting about Turner's contemporary world. We're seeing these coal men hauling coals onto ships. Um, the demand for coal being so great that they need to work overnight to, 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 to meet it. But at the same time, Turner's also including uh, a, a very great debt to his artistic hero, Claude, particularly Claude's embarkation scenes. And although it's a moonlight scene, moonlight watercolour, it, it's bursting with colour um, from the moon, but also from the fire here on the right. And if we look a bit more closely at the fire uh, and at the wharf, I hope you can see that it's full of small round spots of complementary colours, of reds, of blues, of greens. Um, and these are interacting optically as well to produce this vibrant surface on the water, which we can see here. Um, and the, this color combination appears again in this plume of smoke. Perhaps we can sort of see it here, um, which yeah, uh, rising from the fire and this green wash that Turner uh, has used on top of it. He has put these fine threads, uh, these little kind of uh, 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 threads of vermilion, again, uh, producing this richness, this depth of hue that I just don't think he could have achieved by color mixing, this intensity of color, it, as you can tell, I'm very excited about. And it, it's entirely possible that Turner uh, reached uh, this approach, this combination of, 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 of colors uh, without any knowledge of complementary colors, with any knowledge of optics. But I believe that this sophisticated technique that he's adopting um, really can only point to the fact that he has a deep and uh, abiding understanding of color theory. And because of his uh, study of optical theories uh, and the diagrams that we've seen, personally, I don't think there could be any doubt whatsoever that Turner's well aware of the concepts of color that he is using. And what's equally exciting, perhaps even more exciting, um, and perhaps connects to uh, the Bonington Turner exhibition that's, I believe, opening today, uh, the Wallace, is that he's doing something that predates the techniques that were uh, used by Delacroix, for instance, and predates substantially by decades the color systems used by Seurat um, and other pointillists. I mean, he's truly ahead of his time here. Uh, wildly exciting, I think. Um, but we can be absolutely certain that Turner is aware of complementary colors um, because of the, the marginal notes he made on his copy of the translation of Goethe's theory of color. Um, the theories of color, uh, originally published in German in 1810, uh, translated into English in 1840 by Sir Charles Eastlake. Um, Eastlake was uh, widely traveled across Europe. Um, he was himself an artist, uh, but he uh, went on to become the first director of the National Gallery. Also uh, um, a very good friend of Turner's, as was uh, Eastlake's wife, Lady Eastlake. And Turner owned uh, and annotated a copy given to him uh, by Eastlake. The copy is now in a private collection. 
And in one of these uh, annotations that Turner makes, he objects to Goethe's statement that yellow and blue, when mixed, do not destroy each other. That's how Goethe puts it. And Turner writes, yet they do. The violet, the green, and the purple are negatives of the yellow, red, and blue. And here, Turner's repeating the principal complementary colors uh, found in many other treaties of color. But although it seems that Turner was perhaps a bit scornful of Goethe's anti-Newtonian bias, he was particularly fascinated by Goethe's emotional understanding uh, of, of, um, of color. Um, and um, um, I think that what is absolutely certain is that this emotional understanding of colour is really talking to really singing out to, to where Turner perhaps already is when thinking about colour. Uh, Goethe, jo Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, um, by Tintin already a well-established statesman, he's a poet, he's an author, he's a philosopher, um, um, and he, I guess, you know, um, fundamentally unconvinced by Newton's uh, theory that colours are contained in light. And instead, Goethe believes that uh, color is uh, produced by the interplay of light and dark and is uh, 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 appreciated by us through uh, atmospheres like dust and air. Uh, Goethe just simply can't accept Newton's concept that the eye was a passive recipient of light. And instead, he believes that the eye generates its own internal lighting and color effects. Um, and what made Goethe's color theory so popular was his insistence on the emotive potential of color. As I say, I believe that's exactly what uh, appeals to uh, 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 to Turner. And when we see Goethe's uh, 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 wheel next to Harris's, we can see that they're pretty similar. But crucially, what Goethe is saying is that he is pointing to the impact that colors can have on us, how they can affect our mood and be affected by our mood. And he notes the division between plus and minus colors. Uh, yellow and red are plus colors. Uh, he claims they're positive and life affirming, uh, while blues, purples, and greens are minus colors. Um, allegedly, they evoke anxiety and restlessness. And um, I think we can hopefully see how something like this would appeal to an artist like Turner, who's by now, you know, by the 1840s, anyway, for several decades, been exploring just this, this the emotive power of paintings and color. Um, Turner doesn't swallow uh, Goethe's theory whole. Poor Dame Nature, he writes in one of his annotations. But I think he feels that Goethe is uh, 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 onto something effectively. It's, he's pointing Goethe in a direction that Turner's already heading. Um, the emotive, the forceful, the expressive uh, 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 nature of colours, that uh, content doesn't only have to be the, uh, that doesn't have to be the only uh, aspect of painting that colour can uh, be emotive too, in fact, possibly a more emotive, more meaningful than any subject can be. So this brings us uh, on to this uh, remarkable painting. Now, I've given many talks, we've talked about Turner in many aspects to many groups of people, and I can say that despite his multitude of interests and forces, the one thing that connects across Turner's life is his continual fascination with the emotive power of painting. And throughout his works, that's the one constant. The one thing is his determination to make us, the viewer, have a profoundly emotional response to the works that he's producing. And this painting, and it's pendant that we'll see in a moment, is, I think, Turner's greatest love letter to colour. And although its meaning has been much debated, if we look at it as an exercise in colour, rather than a work weighed down by uh, its potential meanings, I think it reveals itself as a painting of immense force, uh, immense power, um, which I think derives almost entirely from the remarkable colouring that Turner's here using. Um, just as an aside, I don't think Turner could ever have moved completely into abstraction, his training, his experiences. I don't think it would have allowed him to completely give up, uh, completely give up, perhaps I should say, form, uh, however much he loves colour. But I think we're looking here at maybe the closest that Turner ever gets uh, in a finished and exhibited work, perhaps I should say, closest he ever gets to pulling away from subject towards something closer to purely emotional content. And in the theories of colour, Goethe uh, opines, I suppose, on virtually every combination of colour, um, and particularly the effects of yellow. And I think we can see that here. Turner is exploring, really, the effects of uh, limiting his colour palette to the most rudimentary of colours in many ways. Um, there's little really in the way of recognisable forms. 
Um, he's experimenting with the associative properties of colour. Um, Goethe's cool tones, the blues and purples, uh, supposedly negative, uh, supposedly producing restless, um, anxious impressions. Next to the warm tones, the reds, the yellows, um, which uh, Goethe says produce warmth, uh, happiness. Um, we're looking for a bubble, um, and the bubble is, um, I think, uh, reflecting in a prismatic way the colours that we're looking at. And the bubble is in some ways a substitute for the rainbow the Bible tells us appears after the flood. But it's a work of really profound um, indistinctness. It's a criticism of Turner's work um, that is much levelled at him, but he perhaps turns it around when he famously says, uh, indistinctness is my forte. But it means that we really don't know what's going on, what is going on. And really, critics have been trying to understand this painting uh, since it was first exhibited. And I think it's fair to say we're no closer to a consensus. It's the morning after the flood. We know that from the title. Uh, a new world is emerging. Um, and perhaps we're supposed to be pleased with that, with the positively uh, 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 positive reds and yellows of the colours. It's usually agreed we're looking at the Ark on Mount Ararat, but who is the figure? Is it Noah? Is it God? Turner seems to suggest it's Moses. What's Moses doing here in the story? Uh, he's not part of the story of the deluge. What are the figures at the bottom? Are they surviving the flood? Are they about to be swept away? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they ready to be reborn? Uh, we just don't know. And really what makes matters even more confusing is, despite the title, the paint, it doesn't completely align with Goethe's colour wheel. Um, so the most obvious colour is this purple here at the top. So if we uh, use that to align the colour wheel, uh, we have to turn it upside down, but maybe that's OK. But where is the green? And what about the yellow? It's throughout the painting, but it's only briefly shown on this sphere that we're looking at. So I don't know, perhaps more so than in many of his other paintings. Um, we can see, I think, that Turner is trying to show us something uh, of the infinity of the whole. This, everything is sort of broken up and everything is, is, is hard to see. And I think he's encouraging us to understand that our eye is dynamically embracing these colours. Um, we're being pulled into this vortex of colour. It represents the known and the unknown world, everything in its entirety. I mean, really talking about the universality of colour, the universality of emotions. Uh, it's really uh, quite huge in that respect. And it was exhibited next to this painting, uh, Shade and Darkness, which is really the beginning of the story that Deluge is about to descend. And intriguingly, most art historians have done just what I've just done, which is to start with light and colour. So start as, as it were with the sort of end of the story. Um, I can't help wonder if that's because we're in some way drawn to the supposedly positive light, the supposedly positive colours uh, in the after the Deluge painting. Um, but I think you can see that Shade and Darkness is painted in predominantly blues and purples. Um, and I think that, that we gain a great deal if we see the two of them together. If we see them separate, I think we lose something. And there is perhaps something about there's a sublimity, a sort of frightenedness, uh, an awesomeness uh, in the darkness, and also an awesomeness in the light. Um, I think there's something really kind of profound going on here, uh, perhaps even more profound than, than, than just Turner's uh, relationship to Goethe, because I think that he is really returning in some ways, either consciously or unconsciously, to the two separate colour wheels suggested by Moses Harris. We have light in a prismatic form, uh, that's colour of pure light, uh, perhaps proposed by Newton, and light in a pigment form, that's colours uh, produced by mixing pigments, uh, one that's perhaps produced uh, by um, experimentation, by trial and error, by artists. And in a way, is it that Turner's uh, telling us, it, it leading us to say that uh, colours have an emotive force in terms of pigment and in terms of their scientific reality? So I'm just going to finish very quickly by showing this last painting. It's actually one of four uh, of the last paintings that Turner produced, uh, Turner exhibited, excuse me. And they were shown in the Royal Academy in 1850, the year before he died. And uh, critics found them difficult to understand when they were shown. And I think, to be fair, um, even now it's not really very really clear what's going on, uh, who the figures are, what they're doing, or where they are, really. Um, and... It, 
One of the critics, one of the critics at the time, uh, described this painting as uh, saying that it showed a great master who had a matchless command of the materials of painting, careless of form and prodigal of light. And he goes on to say the painting had the coolness of dawn or twilight thrown, as it were, through the radiance of a southern sun, which gives the glow and iridescence of the opal. And other critics also picked up on the color effects. And I like to think that here we're looking at, as it were, the culmination of Turner's dedication to color. He is recognizing, I think, the colors can be used almost separate from the uh, design, from the forms that we're looking at. And in so doing, they produce this kind of universality. The ways in which color uh, is being used becomes one of the, not just driving forces of his work, but one of the emotive forces of the paintings. And in effect, Turner's gone from being, I suppose, a very English artist to one who's trying to speak to our emotions. Um, Emotions that go beyond national boundaries, of course, and perhaps um, to pick up something that Ruskin says about Turner, into the infinite, to develop a language that can actually speak to us, uh, all of us, that go beyond perhaps our backgrounds into something deeper about our understanding. Um, I think we can see, I hope we can see that for Turner, Newton and Goethe, the scientific awe of Newton, the poetic melancholy perhaps of Goethe can coexist. And he fused together these uh, approaches to create a, an entirely new and unique kind of painting and something that we are still appreciating and trying to understand to this day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was absolutely fascinating. Such a treat to um, explore those sun-drenched um, images, wonderful images um, further. Um, do you have a couple of questions and a comment that have come through? Um, Barbara says that your comments on the castle, is that Norham Castle? Um, yes. She says, we can, we can see in a small way how the light affects the paintings when we tip our laptop screens back and forward and notice how the atmosphere alters. Um, <laughs> so uh, benefits. Yes, um, one of the confusing things about laptops and televisions is that the primary colours in those are not the same as the primary colours. Uh, in 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 light, uh, in reflected light. So um, perhaps in a sort of similar way to um, the problems that that, that the Turner has uh, and other artists have with with kind of Newton. Actually, now uh, we are seeing screens that uh, uh, don't actually reflect Newton's uh, experiments. So um, I think I, I love the fact that we uh, you can see Turner's experiments by sort of uh, 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 flicking your screen because that sort of uh, it gets into a whole other world of 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 of, of um, color color theory. Interesting. <laughs> um, another question uh, or a question uh, was Turner a divisionist or pointillist avant la lettre? So, um, um uh, what an interesting question. Um, in some ways, yes. Um, I, I mean, I'm fascinated by, and I'm not the only person by Turner's relationship to um as it were, the painters who come after him. Um, and in many ways, you know, Turner is 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 a um, a precursor to lots of the stuff that the Impressionists did and the um, uh, uh, post-Impressionists. He, I don't think we can describe him as a sort of pointillist or, uh, or anything like that because, you know, nobody had invented those terms and nobody kind of, you know, was thinking in that way. But Turner's definitely... Uh, got to the same point in terms of thinking about how colours affect the way in which we engage with a painting. So I, I sort of hesitate to call him um, you know, a, a, an early Impressionist or an early post-Impressionist or anything like that, but it, it's absolutely clear, I think, that, that Turner is a, at the same point that somebody like Seurat is uh, 40 more, uh, 50 years ahead of him. And I, I, you know, not for um, you know, the first time. I think that you know, that just shows how kind of uh, incredibly acute Turner is in, in in not well as an artist, but particularly as a colorist. What, what were the impressionists sort of? They they, they were actually influenced by Turner, or, or they they took influence from. Um, 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 some of them, yes. Um, but interestingly, um, a. a, a 
you know, we could have a whole lecture on this uh, by itself. Um, but interestingly, sort of Turner, uh, Turner's project, what Turner wants to do and what Turner's doing with colour is he's using colour as an emotive force, but he wants us all to be feeling the same thing. Turner is, is, is leading us. And what Turner's not saying is, you know, this is what I see, but you might see something else. And in a way, that's what the Impressionists are saying. The Impressionists are saying, this is what I see when I see this. Um, and Turner's not really saying that. Turner's saying, this is the emotive power of what I see. And I want us all to feel the same thing. So um, they, they, they are doing different things. And even more interestingly, the artist who really goes out and paints uh, on plein air um, is Constable. So the way in which Constable paints um, is much more like the way the Impressions to paint. So although we now think we are seeing these connections, and there definitely are uh, visual similarities, um, Turner's definitely kind of coming at things from a from, from a different perspective. Um, final question. Um, how did Turner manage to paint in watercolours using the dots and threads and contrasting colours without them merging as watercolour usually does? Without them merging? Um, Turner is a... Um, a master at the medium of watercolor. Um, he um, 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 he would have been a, 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 a successful and famous artist if he'd only ever worked in watercolors. Um, but you know, Turner uh, uh, always uh, ambitious. Um, you know, uh, uh, quite quickly moves into oils. But um, um, the way in which British artists um, have kind of developed working in oils, uh, sorry, working in watercolors, is to think about um, how the um, watercolors are applied, but also to think about mixing them with other things. So if we look at some of Turner's watercolors, um, it looks like they are very thickly applied, which um, they may well be, so actually applied you know, repeatedly over the top. Uh, but he may also be mixing them with um, I mean, all sorts of things, sort of you know, gum Arabic being being one of them, as well as water. So he's sort of building up the the the, the, the medium to be used in different ways. And um, you know, throughout his life, he kind of experiments with that. So to get back to the uh, uh, um, Coleman, uh, when we look at the smoke, he's used a, a thin green wash, so a very kind of light. Uh, a, a dilute green color onto which he's adding uh, the watercolors that he is mixing with other um, other things on top to give them a sort of uh, a, a, a thickness. That's the thickness isn't the right word. Solidity, perhaps, is the right word. But he's you know he but, but, yeah he's 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 using these different techniques throughout the same work um, as well. So you know he's um, really wildly experimental, uh, but not. I hesitate to add you know he's not the only person doing this uh, in England, but he's learning uh, or has learned um, there's a milieu of, 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 of watercolorists that Turner comes out of, um, which gives him the basis of, of, to, to do this. So it is, it, it's a fascinating question. And, you know, we could be talking here for another 45 minutes on Turner and his techniques in just watercolor. Thank you. Um, another question that's popped up um, is there a possibility that some of the new pigments colors Turner was using were themselves a product of industry slash, slash extraction? Um, you mentioned cobalt, so um, Adam was wondering if there was something more to say on this. Yeah, I mean, um, um, what's happening throughout the 19th century um, is that uh, uh, through you know, well, let's let's let, let's rewind a bit. We were talking about Moses Harris, uh, Moses Harris, but uh, about, about Field and his sort of production of colours. And so Field starts to produce colours um, um, using some sort of natural dyes. And um, quite quickly after that, um, people start to uh, think about the chemical composition of colours and how to recreate that. And that starts a process across Europe where um, people are, are able to produce colors either through um, adapting natural pigments or uh, actually completely synthetically, um, and then to produce them in ever greater numbers. And for artists, that means that, say, for the um, 
Indian yellow that we were talking about, where the artists had to sort of grind it themselves and add their own binding uh, um, uh, uh, mediums. Artists can just get a tube. And so by the time Turner passes away, uh, it's possible to get uh, um, oil paints uh, pre-made for you, and some of which are synthetically made. Uh, so made in factories, so, so it's not made using any kind of natural uh, pigments at all. Uh, after Turner dies, the next step that really is revolutionary is that people start to put them into uh, metal tubes, squeezy tubes. So when you think about somebody like Van Gogh, you know, painting in yellow, he's got a tube and he can just literally squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Um, and he doesn't have to do anything at all in the way of prep for him. And that frees up artists uh, to paint in, 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 on plein air and the open air in a way that they really couldn't have done before. So Turner's um, uh, 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 able to uh, make the most of these new colours that have been produced. Um, and yeah, heaven knows what would have happened next if he you know, lived another hundred years and seen you know, even more of the colours that were being produced. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that he would have been using those as well. So interesting. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I think that's all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you um, for such a fascinating lecture. Um, Huge pleasure. I, I should mention before we finish up, it's worth mentioning that Matthew will be leading um, an online course specifically on Turner in October.